Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> the task I have set myself up with is as follows. Just in 18 minutes, I'm trying to rescue the religions of the world from this super personality called God sitting in the heaven and cracking a whip. In the same 18 minutes, I've taken a task of freeing the scientific mind from this fixation on this pesky little fellow called the atom. And in this 18 minutes, I've set myself a task of freeing the humanist from a very undignified vision of humanism they have, which says that you are nothing more than bits of carbon that got wound up in this very complex manner through accidents of evolution. They are, all, they are telling you you are all accidents. There's nothing more to you. So I'm going to challenge all these three paradigms and present to you as something very unusual and very interesting that lies at the heart of science as well as the concept of spirituality. Let us start the journey. When you talk to most youngsters, you tell them, are you religious? They'll say, no, we are not religious. What's your problem? This is the problem with a chap called God. He comes with unanswered questions. He comes with too much baggage. And this is the problem with us. We can't, you know, he comes with so many unanswered questions. I mean, in two ticks, the reason why eight people become atheists is very simple. They say, you call your goal almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, and just look around. There is so much suffering, not only in the human kingdom, when that boy in the first row doesn't reply to your text message, but in the living kingdom. Trillions of living things are eating each other alive, struggling. Nature is red in tooth and claw. So if this God is responsible for this creation, he's a nasty piece of work. So what is going on? Let me touch on the deeper aspects of what religions are all about. When you look at the personalities that have started of these religions, they are marvelous personalities, whether it's the Buddha or a Christ. They are marvelous individuals, highly charismatic, highly worked up, highly charged up. What happened? All religions and all mystical traditions start at experiential level. It is never intellectual. Something happens to these individuals that transforms them for the better that really charges them up dramatically to be able to influence millions of people over thousands of years. And these personalities are very wholesome. So what's going wrong? This is what happens. This is the take that I'm giving you from a deeper vision of what religions are all about. Through whatever reason, these individuals have had an encounter of the first kind. They had a deeper glimpse into nature of reality. And when they come out of this experience, the first thing they will say, the, the technical vocabulary is, is a transcendent experience. It defies any vocabulary. Impossible to put it in words what we are talking about. We encountered something so dramatic there are no words to express it. So far so good. Next moment they try to give expression to their experience. And here the trouble begins. Because the moment you try and give expression to this very marvelous, very first and experience, the mindset in which you are operating will kick in. It cannot be otherwise. How can you give expression without using the language, the linguistic ploys you possess already? It's your mindset. It kicks in automatically. So when these prophets try to give expression to their experience, the deeper glimpse of reality, the mindset in which they operate becomes visible. So the same experience, in one case, he says, Christ says, I've seen the Father in heaven. In other case, Buddha says, under the Bodhi tree, says, no, 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 I'm enlightened. Different vocabulary, different expression. I am saying, same experience, a deeper glimpse into nature of reality. What is this all about? They had a glimpse, but the expression was very limited to the vocabulary of the time they lived in. This is what causes a problem. And the reason why it has been an endearing way of humanity has tried to resolve its human condition is this. We all have certain endearing aspects to all of us. What are these? Affinity for other human beings, affinity for living things. It seems to come naturally within us. We also have this inquisitive nature. We want to make sense of what is all going on. What is nature of reality? What is all this? Inquisitiveness. 
we also like to be empowered. We don't like to be pushed about. We like to stand up against forces of nature. These are endearing aspects to all living things becoming more visible in human beings. So what have we done? We have taken these endearing human aspects and projected it on by multiplying it by infinity onto the super personality. Oh Lord, I am little knowledgeable, you are all knowing. Oh Lord, I am little compassionate, you are all compassionate. Oh Lord, I am little empowered, you are all powerful. So these are nothing but human, endearing human aspirations, if you like, that we exaggerate them to the infinite and plonk it on that chap called God. Say, God, you must be that. Why do we do that? Because in, in a way, by projecting this role model, we can build relationship with that role model and become like that, become more empowered, become more compassionate, become more knowing. So it's nothing wrong. But the important thing is whenever you use any ploy, you must recognize, if you like, the, the locus of operation of this ploy and its limitation. And the religious people have forgotten the second part of the equation. It comes with limitation. When you create this ploy, so you can be more empowered, more knowledgeable, more compassionate, and build relationship with this lovely chap called God, you come with a limitation. And the limitation comes from the philosophers. They won't let you off. They'll tell you, if you've got this all-powerful, all-knowing, all-compassionate God, what is going on here? Why so much suffering? And you shudder. And you look at the Lord and say, Oh Lord, this, this is, David Hume is bothering me. Please answer him. And he'll shrug his shoulder and say, You created me like this, you answer. See how, why a monotheist approach in religion will fail. In a world that is strongly dictated by science and rationality, this particular ploy begins to shudder. So be it. It's necessary to use a ploy, but recognize its limitation, then you can live with it. See, I'm not here to undermine monotheism, I'm simply saying recognize its limitation. It won't answer your questions. You just projected, you see, there is a saying that God made us in his image. This person says, no, no, no. We make God in our image. We project a superhuman and try and achieve that particular target by projecting what is already within, outside, and building relationship with it. This is, if you like, rescuing religions from a monotheistic God because it is becoming tiresome and difficult to defend. So be it. This is just one part of the equation. So I come from the science lobby. I studied quantum physics under Sir Roger Penrose. So I'm not some hippie Hindu with hippie physicist. I've studied my subject thoroughly. And you see, in science, how did science progress? What is science all about? Very simple enterprise, very durable enterprise, very useful thing that we've done for thousands of years. How did it progress? We first noticed this world around us has got little objects. And all these objects that we see have certain characteristics, certain, atti certain attributes. So water flows, fire burns. Oh, we are clever. This is the difference between animals and humans. We begin to make sense. We see patterns in nature. And then we try and articulate and see how we can relate to these patterns and extend our power of predictability. What will happen when we put our finger in the fire? This is what science is about. It gives you rules of thumb in order for you to get a handle on reality. It works very well. This is how science progresses. The problem with science is this. It started off the journey saying object or matter and its attributes. Then he said, now let us, let us go this, let us take this further. So it's like a Russian doll. Suppose you go to atom. Let's open up the atom. Oh, atom has got three uh, party, oh, neutrons and protons, electrons. Oh, let's open them up. Again, a little lump of matter and its attributes. Oh, it has got charge, a mass, a spin, oh, quantum number, wonderful stuff here. So what we have done is this simple habit that we have of trying to relate to reality in terms of object and its attributes, we, we continue to extend it into the smaller and the realm of the smaller and the smaller and the smaller. Russian dolls. But without recognizing, I told you, we use ploys in every field, in religion as well as in science. This is a ploy. 
In order for us to get our minds around the nitty gritty of this reality, we produce these elementary particles and attributes. We suddenly recognize that this thing of Russian dose suddenly loses his material status and enters a metaphysical status without us acknowledging it. This is modern physics. It has already entered the realm of, if you like, a non-material reality as the underpinning to this world. Says Schrodinger, matter, he says, material, matter that you're so fixated on. Says Schrodinger, is an appearance, mere appearance. That is a paradox. The underpinning is pristine and pure, but it is mathematical, not material, not object. Mathematical underpinning to this reality. So science has already actually progressed away from a very strong fixation on matter into kind of appreciating a more metaphysical underpinning, which you can call mathematical. But if you like this stodgy kind of this thinking within the box, fixation on matter has not gone away. So it's still major scientists struggle with the findings at the cutting edge of modern physics. How can you explain this creation, this reality, without reference to matter? Matter is an outer appearance, it's an epiphenomena. What is the underpinning? It's mathematical. But how can a mathematical thing turn into a material reality? We have no clue. Leave us alone, Mr. Lakhani. This is the fixation that science struggles with when it tries to explain the universe in terms of lumps of matter, objects, and its attributes. That is failing. So suddenly we find ourselves in this 11-dimensional space-time and strings kind of dancing as they're underpinning to this reality, not some lumps of matter. It's time to let go of matter. Matter, look, suppose you're an engineer, suppose you're doing crystallography. You need all this matter, you need to think of atoms sitting, or if you're a biologist, you need to see how your DNA is constructed. You need that blow, your little lumps sitting around. But when you look at the deeper aspect, that is an appearance. Underpinning is something dramatically different. But it is not, you know, in this vociferous manner, manner accepted by the science lobby. And I keep thumping them. That's, what is it? Tell me, what is this thing that you're discovering? They said, don't ask, we have no vocabulary. So science too is stuck in a rut at the moment. Just as religions are struggling with monotheist God, science is struggling with this phenomena, this fixation on matter, objectifying things, or trying to explain everything in terms of material things. It has lost the struggle. It has lost itself in 11 dimensions. It's not prepared to acknowledge it. So there sits science. Then we come to the third lobby. If I ask you today, do you believe in religions? They say, no, we are spiritual, we are not religious. And of course, then my next question, what do you mean by spiritual? What do you mean by spiritual? They say, we like things like compassion and knowledge. Ah, I said, didn't I tell you? The first approach, the reason why these religious prophets were talking about this idea of becoming empowered, becoming compassionate, being knowledgeable, is being revisited in the guise of humanism. But humanism too is in a way stuck in a rut. Because he's still kind of thinking in the box, literally in the box. He cannot think outside matter. So the likes of modern thinkers, humanist, is simply to say, Mr. Lakhani, we are really nothing but the extension of the material kingdom. Live with it, grow up. All this airy fairy floaty stuff doesn't work. We are just nothing but, if you like, an epiphenomena of matter, a little carbon and hydrogen, neutrogen, neutron, uh, sorry, uh, nitrogen, mixing itself together through accidents of evolution until it becomes this complex. There's nothing more to you, Mr. Lakhani. This is where I part company with the humanist. The tradition that I come from has no difficulty with Darwin, who says we are a continuation of the animal kingdom. Sure we are, but we are not the extension of the material kingdom. There is something dramatically different about us, which cannot be explained in material terms. This is where I part company. And this is where I introduce the word, not materialistic humanism, but spiritual humanism. You are much more than matter. You require this material frame to express this thing, and yet you are not the extension of the material kingdom. How can I be sure? Let me just give you touch on one aspect. 
You see, if you try and define a living thing, one of the things that immediately becomes visible is this. What is the definition of a living thing? There are various ways you can try and explain, but they all fall short of the target. They don't really give the heart of what a living thing is all about. You can say they reproduce. Then I can show you the mule who cannot reproduce, but is waving his tail and still alive. Every definition of trying to define a living thing falls short of the target. I'll give you a new definition. Living things are those things that are not in compliance with the physical forces around us, but in defiance of it. They stand up. They don't like to be pushed about. What's the best example? You are the best example. The ancient man used to cower in the caves, shuddering when the lightning struck. He said, oh, God made sending messages from the heaven. And then he became clever. He said, no, no, I can put that force into wires and light up our auditorium. So you don't like to be pushed about natural forces. You are in defiance of it. You want to sit above it. You want to harness them for your betterment. This is the, this is the, the enterprise of science. See, this is the, if you like, the apex of this particular f vision regarding what humanity, what life is all about. We are not in compliance with physical forces. We are in defiance of it, right from the smallest bacteria. You try and prod it, it'll go, ouch, stop it. Doesn't like to be pushed about. This is the sign of life. You see, this is a great contrast from the materialistic humanism. We say we are just nothing but the extension of the material kingdom. If, we, if that is the case, why should we stand up against natural force? We should let them flow over us and knock us about. Where is the dignity? Where is the human dignity when you say you are nothing more than a lump of matter? This is where the word spiritual humanism comes into its own. One of the ways, you know, sometimes there are certain issues that appear in life sciences which are difficult to address in material terms. I'll just touch on one. In life sciences, you've got neuroscience, and they've explained using CAT scan, they can tell you exactly which neurons are firing when you're dreaming, and all this stuff they can do, fantastic advance. At the same time, when you ask the mature science, let me tell you there are two kinds of scientists. There are those who are very mature, who recognize the limitation of what they've discovered, and know there's much more to be discovered. They're the humble ones. That the Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg and Einstein of the world. Then there are those arrogant ones who say, we have sorted everything out now, we are just tightening the bolts. We know everything. The arrogant ones. When you ask the mature scientists, what is happening at neuroscience? This is what they'll tell you. They say, Mr. Lakani, even though we are very successful in explaining almost every part of the working of the brain and how it interacts with your whole physical being, there is one central hard problem of neuroscience we can't address. So we say, what is that? Mr. Lakani, that is called consciousness. What is this thing that we say cognition, awareness in the lower kingdom and consciousness in the human kingdom? What the heck is that? What is that? What is that? And of course, the people who are very fixated on matter will try and explain material terms. So it's nothing but brain phenomena, Mr. Lakani, live with it. It's just electrical and, and chemical activities in your brain that gives you a buzz that makes called consciousness. There's nothing more to you. Suppose we don't like you, we can come with a hammer and thump you on the head. Your consciousness will go. We told you it's a brain phenomena. I said, no, 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 not a good example. Suppose a child walks into this room and discovers a dimmer switch and starts playing with it. Turns it one way, the light goes off. Turns the other way, the light comes on. The little child will put two and two together and say, ah, the switch creates light. But we are mature. We said, no, my boy, that's not true. The switch is a mere conduit of electricity. It doesn't produce electricity. It's a mere conduit. You're messing around with the switch. The conduit. In the same way says this gentleman, if you hit my head with a hammer or give me an anesthetic, you're not touching my consciousness. You're switching off the flow of consciousness through this physical phenomena. The brain is required to manifest consciousness. You're messing up the switch. You're not touching consciousness at all. It's a hard problem of neuroscience. What is this that allows us access to reality? And yet we don't want to acknowledge it. And that is your spiritual underpinning, revealing itself as consciousness, as awareness of the, of the surroundings around you. That is the difference between spiritual and materialistic humanism.
There's something much more to us percolating through this mind and body, through this frame, and expressing itself through these eyes. Spirit. The same thing the Prophet discovered in their own way, we are rediscovering through the field of science of today. What a marvelous thing to explore. Now, the important thing is this. Spiritual humanism, how do you distinguish a materialistic humanism from a spiritual humanist? Very easy. When you meet a materialistic humanist, his face appears to be constantly constipated. He's struggling to digest the idea that he's a material being. When you meet a spiritual humanist, his eyes light up, his face lights up, because he sees himself reflected in you. A materialist humanist can at best tell you how to live with each other. I don't step on your toes, you don't step on my toes. A spiritual humanist can tell you not how to live with each other, that's called commerce. Teach you how to live for each other. Spiritual humanism is the way. My friends, that is my comment. We are not material beings aspiring to spirituality to improve our material status. We are essentially spiritual beings on a material journey. Thank you, my friends.